Today our scripture lesson comes to us from the gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning in the second verse. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, I was in Colorado for a denominational meeting. We had an afternoon free, and so several of us decided that it would be a fun way to spend the afternoon going up to the top of Pikes Peak. Pikes Peak has an elevation of 14,115 feet. If you've never been, well, as you drive up, it really is beautiful to see. Then when you reach around 11,700 feet, you pass what's known as the tree line, and things get barren after that. When we finally reached reached the top, we went to the little shop where they sell these freshly made donuts and coffee, and now everyone else seemed to really enjoy this side trip adventure. I, on the other hand, had a little issue. I couldn't breathe. As we climbed the mountain, I found that as we were driving up, I I got to the point where I couldn't speak above a whisper. And then when we were standing at the scenic overlook, looking out at this vast expanse before us, I remember noticing that everything was growing dark around the edges and my vision was starting to narrow. That's when the others decided it was time that I left Pikes Peak. Now looking back on that, due to a genetic lung issue, going to that elevation was probably not a brilliant move on my part. But even with that experience in my past, even with that experience in my my memory always, (laughs) I still love mountains. I still love to go to the mountains and drive, drive through the mountains, just lower mountains. When you read Scripture, those that are reading through the Bible all the way through this year or those that are reading through the New Testament chronologically right now, you're going to notice that a lot of the stories in the Bible take place on a mountain, around a mountain, heading to a mountain. On Mount Moriah, God called Abraham to go there and, and to take his son Isaac for sacrifice. And there in the last minute on Mount Moriah, there was a ram caught in the thicket, and that was the sacrifice rather than Isaac. It was a powerful moment of trusting God for Abraham. On Mount Sinai, Moses encountered God and received the Ten Commandments. On Mount Carmel, Elijah had his great contest with the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and he won that spectacular victory. One of the temptations in the story of Jesus took place on a high mountain. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus spent time in prayer. There was the Sermon on the Mount beside the Sea of Galilee. And of course, today's story from Mark's gospel takes place on a mountain. 
Mark tells us that this event in, in Jesus' ministry takes place just after a significant moment for Jesus and his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. It was there that, that Peter had proclaimed that Jesus truly was the Messiah. And Jesus responded by letting his disciples in on what was coming. He said that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. The disciples are caught off guard by that. That's not what they had been planning on when they left everything to follow him. And, and Peter decided at that point to voice his opinion to Jesus, and that didn't really go over well. But I suspect that when Jesus calls Peter, James, and John to go with him up onto this mountain, I'm sure they still had all those words rolling around in their heads and in their hearts. Maybe they thought that when they got up on the mountain, Jesus would be able to explain all of this to them, to help them understand, or, or maybe to even say, okay, uh, here's what's really going to happen. I, I, I just said that. I, I, I'll change it now. I don't think anything could have prepared them for what they experienced on the mountain. Suddenly, this change comes over Jesus. He appears as bright as a light, his clothes wider than bleach could make them. He changed right in front of their very eyes. He was transformed. He was transfigured. The disciples saw Jesus like they had never seen Jesus before. I mean, Peter had said he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and now he looks like it. And then Moses and Elijah appear on the mountain in front of them. Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Moses, that, the Ten Commandment guy, we mentioned him a moment ago from Mount Sinai. I mean, he had led the people, the Hebrew people, to the shore of the promised land. He looked a lot like this. And, of course, Elijah. Elijah is there. And Elijah was the, the number one prophet for the Jewish people. His story ends when, when he is taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. We don't really know what Elijah looked like. But these two men, Moses and Elijah, they represent the law and the prophets the sources of authority in Jewish life. And here they are standing on a mountain talking with Jesus. And then if that weren't enough, Mark tells us that a cloud suddenly appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. The voice of God. And God repeats what he had said at Jesus' baptism when he was just beginning his ministry. He says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Or this is my son whom I dearly love. However, this time, for the sake of the disciples standing there then and, and the disciples gathered now, <laughs> us, he adds three little words to his message. A, a small but life-changing instruction. Listen to him. Listen to him. When we interact with this passage, when we, when we, when we think about this moment on the mountain, this transfiguration moment for Jesus... This is the part where the problem arises for most of us. How often in our lives could things have been different if we would have just listened to Jesus? Not heard, but listened. There's a big difference there, isn't there? In the journey to Jerusalem... Peter and James and John are, are given this, this genuine moment 
a, a transparent event that reveals that Jesus is the beloved Son of God, who, who speaks for God, who is here to fulfill the mission of God. It's this glimpse that will sustain their lives into the future, and, and they will spend a great deal of their lives crying out into a world that doesn't really want to listen to them, but they still do because that's what Jesus does. But for those who listen, those who listen then and, and those who listen now, when we listen, we find help and hope for all the mountains that we have to climb in this life. The good mountains, the beautiful mountains, and the mountains that just take our breath away. If God says that we should listen to Jesus, what keeps us from listening? We may, have, we may have developed selective hearing, not just the things that husbands get as soon as they, they get married, where we only hear what we want to hear, but selective hearing, where we only listen to Jesus when we want to listen to Jesus. Thomas Jefferson had selective hearing when it came to the stories of Jesus. He, he created a book that he called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, or it's what we commonly call the Jeffersonian Bible. He literally took a razor and glue and cut up a Bible so that he could leave out the parts that he didn't believe or that he didn't particularly like. We might not do that, but we can all develop selective hearing when it comes to Jesus. We listen to the things that he says that fits into our life in the moment or that simply sound good. Unfortunately, we don't listen to all that Jesus says. We just pick and choose the, the sweet-sounding things or the simple-sounding things and and when we do that over and over and over again, we reach the point where only a few platitudes about generally being nice people, well, that, only those platitudes begin to define our Christian identity and our discipleship journey. And so we begin to think, well, if we are just nice people, then that's enough. Jesus calls us to be disciples. He calls us to be servants. He calls us to love one another. He, he calls us to be more than just nice. When God commanded Jesus' disciples to listen to, the, listen to him, God didn't add sometimes or when it's convenient, when it fits into your life, when it doesn't disturb. Listen. Standing on the mountain, the disciples heard the voice of God, giving them the simplest, most basic, most fundamental instruction, but one that has the power to change our life, to change our attitude, to change how we affect the world around us. It has the power to change us, to transform us, to transfigure us. Listen to Jesus. So, think about your life. Think about what your version of the Jeffersonian Bible tends to look like. What do you absolutely cut and paste in? Maybe even make bolder than it really is. And what do you let fall to the floor because it challenges you or conflicts with culture or makes you think too much or whatever other reason you give? Does your life reveal to the world around you that you are listening to Jesus or that you're just listening 
when he says something you like, something easy, something that you can apply to someone else. (laughs) We'll even pick the stuff up off the floor when we can apply it to someone else, right? Does your life reveal to the world that you are listening to Jesus? If not, then maybe it's time to obey our God and listen to him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.